The Tom Woods Show, episode 1587. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody, make it your New Year's resolution to stop going to the post office. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer. And with my promo code WOODS, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in WOODS. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Our old friend Gene Epstein is back today, and we want to talk about an article by our friend Dan McCarthy over on the Law and Liberty blog, lawliberty.org. I'm going to link to it, of course, at tomwoods.com slash 1587. And it's called Economic Nationalism as Political Realism. Gene and Dan had a debate on this program some time ago about the Trump tariffs. And in the spirit of continuing that conversation, we want to talk about Dan's recent article and how Gene responds to it. Gene Epstein, remember, is formerly economics and book review editor at Barron's and currently directs the Soho Forum over at thesohoforum.org, which is a tremendous debate series in New York City that I strongly urge you to check out. Gene, welcome back. Uh, It's good to be back, Tom. And while I normally have a lot of quips and jokes and ribbings for you before we start any of these things, there is so much substantive material to go over in the topic at hand that I'm going to dispense with all that and suggest we proceed and cut to the chase. Okay, let's definitely do that. What we're doing today, uh, I did invite Dan, or at least I had CJ reach out to him, and I don't know what happened, but I don't think we heard back. But if Dan would like to come on and talk to you, he is certainly welcome to do so. We are talking today about an article, I'll link to it, tomwoods.com slash 1587, called Economic Nationalism as Political Realism, Mm -hmm. written by Dan McCarthy, Mm -hmm. who has had a bit of an evolution, I would say, over the years in his thinking. Yeah. And he is he seems to be quite in sympathy with the Trump program of economic nationalism. Yeah. And that's not to say that he has no sympathy for market economies yeah. and for markets, but he is arguing that we purists are looking at things through the lens of abstractions rather than cold reality. That's kind of the underlying yeah. gist yeah. of his column. I, I I do want to start off this. It seems I don't yeah. want to prejudice my listeners against the great Gene Epstein. Yeah, uh, my listeners know how great Gene Epstein is, yeah. okay. but I can't help pointing out that on a related topic, yeah. Yeah. you you did recently have a debate with Stephen Moore yeah. at your own Soho forum yeah. in which – you're By lost. the I'm Oxford lost. rules, you were declared the loser. The loser, yeah, absolutely. And and let me before you before you sure. respond to that, yeah. let me point out that if you feel bad about that, no. I want to console you oh, yeah. by reminding <laughs> you that on the Contra Cruise, I lost to Bob Murphy, which is yeah. the worst indignity a human being can suffer. Yeah. So it um, could have um, been worse, come Gene. On, come on, that's ridiculous. <laughs> As you well know, uh, also, of course, having been the slayer uh, of the great uh, uh, Michael Malice in a previous debate that I hosted, uh, you did that. And it's honorable to, to lose uh, to Robert Murphy. It's a little but I have to say, I hope Steve Moore is a nice guy. He's not listening to this. It's a little less honorable to have to lose to Steve Moore. I, I will say that in terms of the strict Oxford style voting, it isn't usual that both sides get double digit gains. I did gain 14 points. And uh, and in terms of the absolute vote, I pushed the vote against Steve from 41 percent to 55 percent. So it wasn't a complete trouncing. I forget how you did against Bob, but it's not relevant. Bob is a great and formidable thinker, and uh, losing to Bob is honorable. Oh, you're and- taking all my fun away by pointing out Bob's <laughs> merits. <laughs> okay. But, you know, by, by the way, uh, look, you get me back into the inside baseball. Do you know that a person on that cruise who shall be unnamed, because I guess he doesn't want to take, come forward, who might have been speaking for a few people, told me that – Look, Tom Woods was sounding like such a cruel and vindictive person going into that debate because you kept doing this crazy joke, Tom, about how, <laughs> how Bob is going to be laid out in a stretcher and die. <laughs> I, I, I even added to it by and I said, look, we're going to be at sea. Bob is going to walk the plank and have to swim ashore and shark and, 
<laughs> I was going to die. And I said, I said to this guy, don't you realize that that Tom will stop at nothing making crazy and dumb jokes about anything when it comes to the cruise? He didn't mean it. He was just kind of revving up a little bit of Of fun. course. How could people not know that? Well, I'll say, look, I mean, we need to wrap up this well, part. Okay, of it, but, but, I'll, but the guy let, let just say, against you for that reason. Th- no, that's just awful. That's, <laughs> that, then, that's just awful. I didn't want that person. There might person's have been others vote. who did that. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's, uh, if, if yeah. You're, yeah, right, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, look, it was it was fun, but let me just point, point out a couple things. First of all, Bob and I were debating pacifism, yeah, yeah. and the video of that debate yeah. is available exclusively yeah. to upper tier members of my supporting listeners program. Uh-huh. So if you want to see the rare occasion of Woods losing a debate, you, you go over to supportinglisteners.com and, 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 and join up. And, and you and, definitely and, don't want to miss it because I was there and I was enthralled at every moment. But getting back to me and my humiliation. Well, no, 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 no. I don't want to oh. get back to you just yet. I want to okay, stick with sorry. me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I want to point out that I was mild by comparison with how Michael Malice treated me oh. in the months leading up to our debate oh. because I'm half Armenian, as you may know. Oh, yes. And at one point, Michael tweeted out a video of an orchestra performing a remembrance ceremony for the Armenian genocide. Wow. And that was meant to indicate, you know, what was going to happen to me in our debate. I mean, that's that's way worse than anything I did with okay, Bob. Okay, malice was even worse than you really showed his malice, absolutely. And yeah. by the way, okay, as long as you brought it up, what happened, though, after that victory of Tom's was that I then started my soul forum, and I wrote Tom, and I said, Tom, there are any number of things you might want to debate. And then Tom actually wrote me, guys, that he was think- he think- thinks he'll re- I'll retire from debating for a while. So I I started to call Tom the Bobby Fisher of debating. And of course, Bobby Fisher, for those of you who don't know, beat Boris Spassky, became chess champion of the world, and then never played uh, a champion chess again until decades later when he, when he played Spassky again. So indeed, I guess I humiliated Tom enough to say, look, you had this one victory against Malice, and then Tom did indeed decide to do this, this rather confined debate on the Contra Cruise that isn't revealed for the world, but then happily, Bobby by the way, I don't know what happened to you, Tom, a little soul searching. The big news for everybody is that Tom has now told me that he might consider returning to do a soul forum debate. And uh, these things are in negotiation at the moment. So I just want to tell the listeners that exciting news. And it seems like there would be a certain bias in my direction, though, if people get a free drink by saying my name, you know? <laughs> so we may suspend that rule Thank you for, for the, just that one see, that session. Ju- that just shows Tom's incredible humility as a human being, and we might consider that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead, Tom. You want to talk some more about your debate? Let's, what do we do? Where do we go from here? All right. Look, Gene, you and I could joke and talk about stuff like this all day, but let's right. get into the meat of the article that we have determined to discuss today, and that's yeah. the Dan McCarthy article I mentioned before. Yeah. Um, maybe we might start off with you describing what economic nationalism is, I mean, yes. at least in the, yes. the way Dan explains it, and, yes. and, and yes. also what you know, he views us as being kind of head-in-the-clouds abstract theorists, whereas he's the and by the way, I like Dan, you like Dan. I'm not yes. saying this to put yes. him down, but and I don't think he would dispute this characterization. He looks at us as being sort of, you know, well-meaning, but <laughs> head in the clouds, abstract theorist, whereas he's the hard-headed realist. Well, that's fair enough, that part of it. And uh, I, you, you, uh, you offered uh, a, a sort of thumbnail summary earlier, Tom, when you said that he's moving closer to Trump. Uh, and uh, there's truth in that, but... Actually, uh, Dan is moving a little bit beyond Trump because there's rather alarming endorsement of industrial policy in this article, which I think goes a little bit beyond what even Trump has ever said. Right now, describe what industrial policy is. Well, okay, yeah, industrial policy is essentially uh, the government steps in and starts to run the show in different ways. I mean, it's it's not quite socialism, you might say. Maybe it's a little bit more like, uh, you know, like Mussolini type. Uh, well, specifically, corporate. it would be something like yeah. there's there's some emerging technology that all the gurus say is the wave of the future, so the government gives it a boost. Well, something okay. like that. Oh, all right. But but look, Tom, all right, you might say, but, but, but uh, the darling of industrial policy, uh, you're not old enough to remember, Tom, perhaps, but, uh, but in, the, in the 80s and early 90s, it was MITI, the, the, uh, the, the Japanese planning board, that was the darling of industrial policy. 
and Mitty was supposed to be sort of making decisions at the high level for who who should be favored, and it didn't necessarily emphasize what you said. I mean, it could or couldn't. Now, uh, data re- research on Mitty showed that they just about got everything wrong, which uh, and and got everything wrong uh, often for crony capitalist reasons. So uh, bear that in mind. It is a kind of a general thing, and and uh, we'll get to it. But uh, but Dan jumps in with both feet and endorses uh, Japanese industrial policy. So indeed, you're right that it's uh, you know it's 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 picking winners and losers, but not necessarily of a technological kind. Uh, you know, Mitty. Uh, well, I just wanted people to have an example of what industrial okay. policy okay. specifically okay. could amount to. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. All right, sure. Yeah. All right, uh, but but indeed, I guess we've sort of defined it. I I I just wrote down here working definition of Dan's. Ex- economic nationalism, it is that you are prepared to support tariffs in certain instances and industrial policy in other instances, as in, and indeed you're right that it has to do with uh, supporting uh, technology. Is that what you Because bear, bear in mind that Dan goes on to say, uh, we, we, his, some of his most stunning remarks, or that, that it's a pretty bad idea to, to be endorsing high tech. I don't know if you noticed that he said that, that we should be just uh, favoring garden variety manufacturing. So uh, he goes into a rather odd uh, ways. All right. So have so Tom have 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 we more or less defined what industrial policy is? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Good. 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 I just want to because not everybody knows the term. It, it as you say, oh. it, it was it was popular in the eighties. Yeah. And and yep. then you don't hear so much about it. Uh, uh, Tom, absolutely right in terms of proceeding because so often uh, in any kind of podcast interview by anybody it gets to be a little bit inside baseball and uh, you and I assume that since we understand it uh, not everybody uh, that everybody else must and indeed it's good good to clarify these things even to the point of maybe boring our, our most sophisticated listeners so I endorse that completely but but I, I, I would like to start with a kind of an overview in this sense because when you talk about our having that Dan thinks that uh, that economists like us have our head in the clouds. Uh, I want to say that there is a certain element of truth in that, at least truth in that for Dan, and truth in that even uh, generally because of this. Because too often, even Austrian economists make the mistake of talking about economic, the conformism of the economy, the way in which people mostly sort of vote with their feet, uh, the fact that consumers are generally sovereign. And as you know, Tom, I, I mentioned this, uh, I think, on the Contra Cruise, uh, I endorse Murray Rothbard's point that even though consumers tend to be sovereign, even though there's a tendency to serve consumers, uh, really, fundamentally, free markets are all about individual sovereignty. And why is that important to stress in Dan? Dan's case, because Dan is a conservative who clearly, viscerally, sort of does not like uh, the radical atten- tendencies of entrepreneurial ca- capitalism. More and more specifically, there's still clearly something in him that does not like uh, having uh, to buy and sell with the Chinese, uh, with 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 the Ch- maybe with China's government. Uh, he clearly thinks they're corrupt. There's something grubby about it, uh, and all of that, and that, and that he thinks of. Free Free market economists such as you and me as being sort of amoral, you know, whatever the market will bear. And every once in a while, we sound that way. And yet the truth is that because there is individual sovereignty, there are enormous options for Dan to do it differently. And I like to cite, as uh, probably I've had those familiar with listening to me, uh, familiar with my citing the Amish, citing the Mennonites, citing the Hasidic Jews. There are people who do go their own way. There are people like the Amish who refuse to use electricity and cars and refuse to use tractors. Uh, there are Jews like the Hasids who refuse to go into the two professions that the Jewish boys are supposed to go into, law or medicine. And the reason they don't is because they think that it means that they hobnob too much with Gentiles. So only a handful of them can go into those professions. Uh, and more particularly for Dan, it may sound whimsical of me to say this, but I really mean it seriously. Uh, if he doesn't like people 
people to buy from China, if he doesn't like high tech or if he doesn't like any number of things, then let him set up a sort of shopping website so that people can be advised about what goods to buy and what goods not to buy if he doesn't like what other people do. And so uh, that's the libertarian solution. It's been pointed out, for example, that some of the craziest and most retrograde and repressive rules prevail in co-op buildings where they, they outlaw smoking. And it's their building. People live there. They've decided on majority rule. And if that's the way they want to live, so be it. And so, again, I only want to tell Dan, if you've got a lot of complaints and worries, then take it to the people. There are a lot of conservatives out there who might agree with you, uh, who will be willing to conform to your wishes. I could cite the Montgomery bus boycott, but that brought the bus company down in, uh, down in Montgomery to its knees, led by Martin Luther King. I could cite my father and all and so many other Jews who would not buy German cars 20 years after World War II, even even though maybe those German cars were good for them. We don't make decisions based strictly on economics. Not even Tom and I make those decisions. I could have made much more money in my life if I'd gone into, le if I'd become a lawyer and I'd got into litigation. It, you know, even though I did lose my last case, as, as I just told Tom, my last uh, debate. Uh, but uh, I chose not to. I've been much happier earning the chump change of a journalist rather than the mega bucks of a lawyer. So people make their individual choices all the time. And if you don't like the fact that we buy from China, so be it. The other night when I was debating the issue of China, somebody asked me, can you buy from a country that, that employs slave labor? I said, well, you make an interesting point. You know, you call it a country, but I don't buy from countries. I buy from people. And, and and if I knew that I was buying a good from a company that employed slave labor, I really would refuse to buy from them. It just would stick in my craw. I don't even know if, if my refusing to buy would have a whole lot of effect, but it simply would not wash with me. So uh, again, I want to tell Dan, no, we are not, no true free market people simply say that the market is a series of choices. And if you want to make a conservative choice and persuade others to do so, so be it. Go for it. We support you completely. So that's the framework I want to start with. But now let's get into the nitty gritty of the economics of what uh, what Dan wants to say. Do you have anything to add to that? Because as, as usual, Tom, I end up sort of hosting <laughs> and becoming my own interviewer. Anything yeah, to no, add well, to that point? I, I want to make sure I want to make sure we've got exactly right. Yeah. what his precise complaints okay, about China okay, is. Okay. It's not oh, just that it's selling us cheap goods. Well. Although he thinks that is part of it and that, that we libertarians yeah. are so short-sighted, we think, oh, cheap goods, that's good. And we don't see that it's a poison pill. I'm, I'm going to get into that, sure. But look, again, I, I guess I'm going to be reading between the lines. Having had the experience of, of debating Steve Moore about China, you know, somebody asked me about the slave labor. I think there's a sort of undertone that, you know, we're dealing with grubby people. And if you're dealing with people you don't like, okay, but let's get, let's cut to the chase. All right. Uh, now, the first thing he said, I, I'm going to try to take it in sequence, which might as well just is an easy structure. Uh, bear in mind that he does begin by making the outrageous comment that market liberals do not think in terms of the of, of the uh, the crony capitalist market that all they do is think in terms of tariffs and industrial policies weighed against a pristine market and Dan condescendingly reminds us all that the market has never been pristine now Don Boudreau got uh, uh, Don Boudreau who likes writes a lot of misses almost entirely about international trade got inflamed by this and challenged Dan to cite one case from Milton Friedman to Bastiat to Mises of people who talk about tariffs and industrial policies who don't realize quite specifically that we don't exist in a pristine market. So again, Dan sort of offends those of us who have read these people on industry, on, on, on free markets by implying that they are blind to the fact that there is no pristine market. But that, in a way, is the debater's point with Dan. Because now let's get to the next part about the cheaper goods. We'll get to the other part, uh, Dom Tom. But I'll quote for him. He asks sarcastically, why worry if China just wants to sell us cheaper goods? That's great for consumers. According to theory, if China is cheating, the, the market itself will sooner or later wreak vengeance. No one can sustain a diseconomical policy indefinitely. 
quote unquote. And by the way, Tom, I will say that he, he, as you know, he will then go on to compare China to the market mafia, to the mafia mart. And uh, so it clearly the cheating and all the rest of it clearly sort of offends Dan in a way that it doesn't necessarily offend me. But because, by the way, I, I think by and large, the cheap goods come from the fact that they're cheap labor. And the cheap labor, of course, comes from the legacy of, of communism. And I think that it's great that we're buying from that cheap labor bidding it up and lifting them out of $2 a day poverty. But now let's address what Dan says. Uh, he's asking the question, why isn't it okay to buy cheaper goods? Doesn't that enrich consumers? Well, first of all, of course, it also enriches producers because more than half of what the U.S. buys from China consists of intermediate goods that go to producers. And so it helps businesses, uh, actually even more than consumers directly helps businesses because they buy the intermediate goods from China that become inputs into the final goods that our domestic businesses sell. I just wanted to correct him on that. And also, by the way, uh, when he talks about the market itself will sooner or later wreak vengeance, we don't say that the market will wreak vengeance and it isn't sustainable. Uh, China's mercantilism, if a mercantilism Capitalism really exists, or China's cheap labor can persist for years to come. But now let's get to Dan's uh, response, where he talks about uh, a lawful market, a law mart versus a mafia mart. And what he specifically says is that this mafia mart is going to maintain cheap prices for quite a while. It's going to drive the law mart into bankruptcy, and then it's going to hike its prices. That's sort of like the old story about why we should always fear buying something cheap, because it's really a plot to bilk us in the end by driving out of business any company that can't sell cheap or doesn't sell cheap. And here, by the way, I like the little turn of phrase from Don Boudreau, who addresses this specifically as well. He says almost anything is possible, but only a tiny fraction of possibilities are plausible and an even smaller number are probable. And of course, he makes the point, Don does, that in the international marketplace, if the Chinese are really up to that, they are out of their minds because the vast majority of products that China sells are also sold in other countries. There are hundreds of steel producers, as he points out, in dozens of different countries. So the idea that uh, the Chinese uh, really realistically think that this is what they want to do would make them fools if they really want to. So therefore, again, Boudreaux, putting it well, is conceding that anything is possible. But the idea that we are not going to buy these cheap goods because of this fantasy that someday those mercantilist Chinese are going to hike the prices when we know that's really not in their minds and they're not really a Uh, and we know that they're probably not that stupid, then it's a bit ridiculous. And here I want to play the card I played with Steve Moore, which is to say, bear in mind that Dan is asking us to suffer, suffer the assault on our rights as buyers and sellers and suffer Trump's tariffs, Suffer suffer tariffs that impede capitalist acts between consenting adults. So the burden of proof is on him in a value sense, but it it doesn't even make good economics. So that's what I have to say about the cheap good plot, Tom. And here again, I'll pause for any comments from you. (laughs) Go ahead. Well, my main comment right now is let's pause for a quick message. Okay, go ahead. Folks, I got a lot on my plate, so I am merciless about how I allocate my time during the day. And one thing that's made me crazy as an author who ships out a lot of books is going to the post office. It takes forever, and it's a hassle. In fact, it got to the point where I've literally hired somebody to do it for me. But with Stamps.com, those trips to the post office can be a thing of the past. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer. So whether you're a small office sending invoices or you're an online seller shipping out products or even a warehouse sending out thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com has you covered. And it doesn't just save you time, it saves you money too. With Stamps.com, you get discounted postage rates that you can't even get at the post office. No wonder over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. Right now, my listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Woods. 
That's stamps.com. Enter Woods. Well, Gene, we were talking about industrial policy just a few minutes ago, and we were saying that Japan pursued it with some vigor, apparently. But Dan wants to point out that, look, even though Japan, obviously its economy has cooled down in the past couple of decades, (laughs) the fact is it's still the number three economy in the world, still has an amazing post-war achievement it can point to. And doesn't this go to show that, it became an industrial superpower, not by being purist free market, <laughs> but by intervening in, in strategic places. What's wrong with that? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, by the way, I had to laugh a little bit at, even, uh, at, at this idea that, it's, that uh, and I'm quoting from Dan, Japan's economy has cooled off in the last 20 years. You know, so the last 20 years goes back to the year 2000. And it's just a little bit funny that the market crash of the Nikkei occurred in the early 90s, and the 90s have been called by everybody. Japan the last decade. Last decade. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just that, I mean, you know, he can't even get his empirical data straight, you know. I mean, Japan began to sort of muddle out of this growth recession by the aughts, but really, it was truly, it's been 30 pretty bad years for Japan. Uh, Japan's rate of, look, the U.S. rate of growth has been pretty dismal since the year 2000. And by any reckoning, even if you make it on a per capita basis, Japan isn't even doing as well as our U.S. But of course, now I'm bringing in the U.S., so maybe complicating matters. But I want to add some other point that Dan adds by endorsing industrial policy. Quote, China has surpassed Japan only recently and only by using much the same strategy that Japan had used to become an industrial superpower. The data that we have at hand, or any way that you look at it, basically says that. In the case of China, because China really is the easiest case to cite. I'll get to Japan in a moment. But here he's saying that China did it with industrial policy. Now, most of us know who've been sort of following the history of the Japanese economy or read much about it. It was in 1978 that massive market liberalism was installed in China, that suddenly that the farmers were permitted to sell their produce in a free market, that businesses were encouraged. There was a book published by Orville Shell called To Be Rich is Glorious, and that was the declaration of Deng Xiaoping. So you know that from all kinds of just any account of what happened in China, it turned toward markets. And we know that from the Economic Freedom Index uh, from China, that the Economic Freedom Index in China began to rise in the 80s and 90s and into the aughts. And recently, it's wavered because China has begun to respond a little bit to the entrepreneurship and become more of a managed economy. So the Economic Freedom Index has taught us that there really are gradations of market economies and that you can indeed install market mechanisms even with the background of government domination. And when that happens, you see real results. China opened its markets up to the world. There's enormous investment by the U.S. and China. The U.S., by the way, sells uh, almost as much, uh, sells in terms of product, U.S. companies sell to the Chinese domestically. The U.S. companies that are in China, invest in China, sell to them almost as much as the U.S. economy technically buys and imports from China. So in every which way you show it, China was mired in uh, in poverty when they had a managed top-down economy. When they installed market liberalization and when they turned toward markets, that's when matters improved. The case of the Chinese, of Japanese is a little bit more complicated, but certainly any investigation of the role of industrial planning in Japan has shown that that it caused more harm than good. That typically the top-down planners didn't want, they, for example, they discouraged the automobile industry because logically, you know, Japan's a small country and doesn't it get along better with high-speed uh, railroads? So that was their idea, so they were discouraging it, but they couldn't stop it. Uh, and obviously, they, there was always private property and a reasonable degree of capitalism in Japan. It's always had a high economic 
Freedom Index. And on top of that, obviously, the Japanese are very entrepreneurial people. So they're really, all the evidence that we have for Japan and China indicates that central planning, industrial planning was always a drag and that markets were, the, were what made the difference empirically. Now, is there anything you want to add to that, Tom? Well, I actually, just in the interest of time, because there's, yeah. as you and I were saying before, yeah. we could almost do a Gene Epstein month just on this column. <laughs> But I, I do want to just stick to okay, points okay. that jumped out at me. Yeah, all right, uh, he, all right, yeah. He takes right. a minute to talk about comparative advantage, yeah, yeah, which is something that, that that's uh, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. anybody in Economics 101 learns about, that you yeah. know, one country you know, focuses on one thing where it has some particular advantage, the other one does oh, likewise, wow. and then they produce more than if they were in isolation, and then they trade, well, and everybody's better off. Well, so, okay, okay, Tom, no, 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 okay, but all right, Tom, but you, you, there's one aspect of that you didn't stress to do it totally justice, but but if you want to let me talk, I will go ahead, yes. Well, hold on, hold on. If you're going to say that it also works on an individual level, well, no, I'm no, aware no. of that. No, 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 Tom, I'm, I'm, I'm only, I'm, I'm saying that, that it just begins, it really begins from a, from a single statement, which is that, that there's nothing in country B, that country B can produce more efficiently than what country A can produce. It's, it's disadvantaged absolutely in every possible oh, way. Oh, that's right. That's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's the problem. Let's say you have a country, yeah, that, yeah. that is more efficient in the production of everything Precisely. than the other country. The you other, would think yeah. there's no possible gains from trade there. Yeah, yeah. But there are. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and, yeah, sorry. But, no, you're right. I accept that. You're right. Yes. And 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 so the, the, and the, the point is uh, uh, that I, I guess I'll say what, what an economist with some humility is saying, but here I think it's interesting that Dan – identifies this kind of economic insight with hubris, with, with prescriptionism. In other words, I'll, I'll, I'll hold that thought and I'll get to it in a moment. All that an economist is saying is that when we observe this, and then we will also observe empirically that there actually is trade between these two countries, that trade does occur, and it occurs because of what I actually prefer to call, by the way, Tom, relative advantage, because comparative advantage, that term, is often confused with absolute advantage. It's only that. It's only that. And actually, it does get more easily down to the level of the individual to illustrate the principle. I liked somebody tweeted to me recently when, when I was correcting somebody on, on comparative advantage that actually he said, just imagine that that this country consists of supermen, of, you know, the, the superman comic book. They are super at everything. And the, the other country is just mere mortals. Well, obviously, those supermen should be spending all of their time saving lives and fighting evil. And and obviously the inferior country should be providing everything else for the, their comparative advantage is saving lives and and fighting evil and and therefore we inferior people should be doing all those other things they do so much better than we do like you know making dinner or whatever else for them so they can pursue their comparative advantage of fighting evil and even though of course obviously they can paint their homes and make dinners and do it all better than we can and so the point then is that the superior economy uh, should concentrate on that thing those things that it does ultra best and then buy from the inferior economy those things that it doesn't do nearly as well as, as it does for the ultra best. And that's the reason why trade does occur. And in a way, I introduced the, the word should and the word should is almost misplaced there. It's just an observation of empirical reality is the point. It's just that what does happen, and 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 I just noticed, I, I looked up Mises' description of comparative advantage, because I remember he said something unique about it, and I, and I like the point he said. He said that the hostility to the idea of comparative advantage comes from mercantilists who hate free trade. It rankles them. They, they want tariffs, they want intervention. They want, you know, so uh, that's interesting that Mises said that. I hadn't realized that, that he did in his book, Human Action. But now, Again, we're only describing for comparative advantage an empirical reality. And uh, we're not saying when we talk about a comparative advantage that the inferior country shouldn't try to become a group of supermen. Two, we need as many people as possible to uh, to fight evil in the world. You know, we're not saying that the uh, country that's inferior shouldn't shouldn't do everything it could and and encourage entrepreneurship and become a market economy and uh, and have uh, absolute advantages in the world. We're only talking about a moment in time, analyzing a situation. During 
during a fixed period of time when when all the producers in one country are inferior in productivity to another country. But let's hope that changes. Let's let a hundred flowers bloom. And so that what that's what gets us to Dan's rather odd objection, where he assumes that economists are maybe industrial prescriptionists, industrial planning prescriptionists, or maybe hubristic prescriptionists who enjoy watching this situation. So he says that, uh, may may I read the passage? Uh, Just consider what comparative advantage would mean at the individual level. If Joe is a computer programmer and Jack is a janitor, comparative advantage would say that Joe should spend all his time programming, and Jack should spend all his time taking out Joe's trash. If Jack should started to learn programming, he would initially be much worse at it than Joe, uh, and Joe would be wasting time by taking out his own trash. Oh, the inefficiency. Well, again, he, uh, Dan assumes that we're prescribing. If Joe, the, the guy who takes out the trash, wants to spend his time be, becoming a computer programmer, fine. But in a marketplace, by the way, he's going to give up some income. And if he wants to work nights and weekends studying to be a programmer, then who's to object? That sounds great. The guy has ambitions uh, to uh, to get a better job, and uh, that's all terrific. And, and, and Dan is making fun. Of, of those of us who talk about comparative advantage, he says, oh, the inefficiency. Well, again, I guess Dan assumes that if uh, Joe wants training as a computer programmer, he's going to get a subsidy from the state in order to do it. But no, but you know, Joe is just going to have to manage it in whatever way he can. Uh, so, I mean, assuming that, that's that's Jack. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, again, the odd thing is that, is that uh, uh, Dan has such suspicion and sort of like underlying hostility to perhaps the hubris of market people, a market analyst, or perhaps thinks of us as prescriptionists, that he thinks that we regard comparative advantage as a prescriptive idea rather than simply a descriptive analysis in any moment in time. Right. Yeah. We're not saying it's yeah. a good thing that one yeah. country is terrible at everything yeah, yeah, yeah. or that Jack has no idea how to yeah. do technically advanced things. It, yeah. This is the situation, and given this situation, it's beneficial for them to trade. But yeah. at no time are we saying, this is the ideal. Yeah. One yeah. person stinks at everything. And the other, <laughs> it's <laughs> just so that you understand that the <laughs> benefits of trade are so great that they apply even when you have absolute superiority of skill of one over another. If, if, if some person works for Tom Woods and assists him on his podcast, but then that person trains him or herself to be a better podcaster than Tom Woods, then we comparative advantage theorists say, go for it, wonderful. And even Tom Woods says that. So again, Tom Woods doesn't want to keep his employees down. You know, They want to spend, they want to moonlight learning and, or even learning from him to be better at what he does. Does, then Tom Woods is going to applaud it. So oh, yeah, in I fact, want- the the guy who used to be my tech guy, yeah. has you know has moved on to conquer larger worlds, and I encourage that. And that now, by the way, everybody who's working for me now, yeah. I'd appreciate if you stayed put for a while because yeah. I don't feel like okay. hiring. Okay, Tom Woods showing his ugly side, but that's, <laughs> but, 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 but what Tom is done. Tom is not sounding like a comparative advantage theorist. Then he's just sounding. He's just voicing certain self-interested uh, feelings that are private to him. So I want you to know that, Dan, uh, just in case you're listening. Uh, well, so, it's interesting, by the way, yeah. when he gets to intellectual property, yeah, yeah. he makes what may actually be a valid point. Oh, yes. When, yeah, when he yeah. says he was debating with a trade policy oh, expert yeah. and this trade expert said, well, look, because Dan was saying intellectual property is a kind of protectionism. Yeah. And the trade expert said, no, 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 it's a government granted monopoly to spur innovation. To spur innovation but, yeah, but, yeah. but Dan could just as easily come back and say, all right, well, so is protectionism yeah. in a certain way. Yeah. Well – Okay. You know, no, well, I mean, I'm glad you said it in a certain way, but, 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 but I won't make an issue out of that. By the way, first of all, I agree with what you just said, which is that in a sense, when it comes to intellectual property, Dan does at least have a talking point. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that even if he were totally right of intellectual property and that it's inconsistent with other things, I don't think that it carries his other arguments the least bit. I don't think that that he can make a case for industrial policy or that he can make a case for tariffs because the idea that tariffs spur innovation is a bit of a reach, as I'm sure you'd agree, Tom. It uh, it might or might not uh, be uh, doing uh, so. Right, yeah. but I yeah. mean, I guess in other yeah. words, he's saying yeah. – 
uh, you're willing to engage in some yes, forms of yes. restrictionist behavior That's to, right. to bring right. about yeah, your yeah, goals. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, okay, yeah. But so let, let's talk about industrial policy. Uh, as you know, Tom, the, the, the reason why he sort of has us a little bit is because libertarians are divided on this issue of intellectual property. I guess, I know, maybe you tell me, Tom, because I, I know, I guess the Misesians basically agree, agree with Stefan Kinsella, who's been the biggest uh, advocate of no protection for patents or innovation. I don't know. I'm just curious offhand. Uh, there are people who, who tend to disagree with Kinsella, even the, even Mises, pure Misesians. Yes, yeah, there yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so therefore, okay, yeah, they disagree with them. And so bear in mind that, you know, by the way, I, I, will, I will say something interesting. I was talking with David Friedman, who, uh, you know, is he's an ANCAP. He's a, and, uh, and, you know, son of Milton Friedman, who's gone beyond Milton and, and advocated for anarcho capitalism, uh, even though, of course, according to Rothbard, without enough kishkas in it, enough hate the state philosophy. But when I, when I, when I, when I was discussing it briefly with David, David actually said, Head with a certain sort of emotional fervor, he said, look, look, it, like it's a property, right? When you work on something that hard, you write a book or, or you invent something, that's your property. That should be protected. And so, and so uh, David really actually was simply making the argument that the protection of patents and copyrights was all about the government's protection or the law's protection, because uh, David is an ANCAP, not necessarily through the government, the, the legal protection of property that's justifiably yours. And of course, Kinsella says that it isn't really, can't really be understood as such. So my, my, my only point in response to Dan is that Dan is saying that the defense of IP protection is strictly a consequentialist argument about it spurring innovation. I will only tell him that what will Dan say to those who believe and would argue with Dan that it's really the same kind of property right as, you know, building your own house is. You know, as David Friedman was implying, it's effort to build your own house, but it's also effort to write a book and it's effort to, to invent something. So it is a property right. Uh, that was the argument. But then, look, in a way, he does have us in terms of of consequentialism because I do I do believe as a libertarian that we start with values we start with the zero regression principle but I think that we rarely can leave it at that we have to look at the consequences of respecting uh, people's rights we have to recognize that if somehow if you're somehow saving a life of a million people by trampling on somebody's right then sounds like you got a good argument you know just to use an extreme example and so the consequentialist argument does carry some weight with me, and I feel a little bit uh, unhappy with it. I, I keep, by the way, badgering Stefan Kinsella to get into the consequentialist argument more than he has. He sent me a monograph he'd written, which I haven't gotten a chance to read. So, you know, you, uh, again, if you're going to argue against IP, you're going to say, well, look, it really cannot be defined as a property right. And then in addition, in so many cases, consequentially, patents and copyrights may even slow innovation more than they speed it up. But again, I guess at the end of the day, if we want to grant the, the, the point that it's all about consequences and spurring innovation, I will say that it's not a strong point on Dan's part. It is at least a talking point. But I don't think that even if we were to grant it 100 percent of the way, to analogize it with tariffs, where there is, again, a burden of proof on government intervention, we know that as a practical matter, it isn't even the intention of tariffs to spur innovation. It's mainly other intentions. And of course, the consequences of tariffs are very different. So if the burden of proof is on Dan to defend tariffs, I don't think you can do it by playing that card. With regard to intellectual property, yeah, I agree yeah. with you about, yeah. I mean, I like to be able to argue things on both deontological and consequentialist grounds. Yeah, I, I yeah. like to win everywhere I can win. I want to yeah. win so much I'm going to get bored with winning. <laughs> you know? yes. And so I, I agree with you. I'd like to see more of that. And there have been people who have um, worked yeah. on that specifically or, or have against, tried yeah. to give examples of yeah. how could yeah. an author be able yeah. to sell a book yeah. in a non-IP world? And there are different right. models. And I'd like to hear that spelled out a little bit more. Sure, um, sure. And, and actually, I'm scanning that book. It was called, it's funny that there's a book called in, in, Against Intellectual Property and then there's another book, Against Intellectual Monopoly. Monopoly. Which, and that which, one does which, focus yeah, more on the the consequentialist It's stuff. almost entirely consequentialist. And indeed, I, I really think you can make more of it. I, I gather that all 
all the patent wars that take place in software and and just sort of stunning facts. The Wright brothers, after they invented the airplane, they were really very vigorously through patent law impeding progress in that area. There's so many horror stories about the use of patents. And and of course, crazy, crazy lawsuits like like the fair and balanced lawsuit that Fox brought uh, against, uh, what's his name? Uh, He made a big joke out of those people. You know, the the, the guy who was uh, the comic who was then uh, became a senator and then lost his job. I'm, I mean, I forget. Al Franken. Yeah, Al Franken was sued by Fox for for using the term fair and balanced. We get just this crazy stuff that that, that was copyright law that they had invented that phrase. Or, or you know, all the cases that could have been brought against Shakespeare for stealing his plots for his plays. You know, if they had that kind of law in those days. Uh, but anyway. All true. But my point is that I I do think, again, getting back to Dan, that even if it is a a government granted monopoly to spur innovation, I think it's a stretch for him to use that simply as the defense of tariffs, because tariffs consequentially really have very many other effects. And they are just for starters, a violation of rights. All right. I Uh, I want want to start. Well, let's let's. uh, Let's yeah. wind down with one more. One more, uh, just one more. Okay, <laughs> just one oh, more. Okay, We're gonna... okay, okay. Here's the best. Here's the best. Here's the best. And uh, here's the best. Because... Oh, all right, all right. I'll let you choose. Yeah, yeah. If oh, you okay. get something that's the best, that you then you choose. All right, uh, all right. Thank you, thank you, Tom. Okay. Uh, by the way, I I, I want to take a personal jab at Dan in this way. No, I, I I didn't. I guess I think I did team. You know, I'm trying to remember whether I teamed up with Dan as a debater, and then Dan mentions that he that he was debating trade policy. And now I just wonder, Dan, if you're listening to this, I want to do a shout out and say, why, you know, you know that Tom and I both admire you for a lot of stuff. We also think you're a great guy personally, and you knew that we were going to criticize you. Uh, did you, were you afraid that Tom and I were going to gang up against you? Well, you know, the last time you and I did have a debate, Tom just re- decided to become just the neutral uh, moderator, and he didn't use a two against one kind of advantage against you. So I really do think that you were remiss in not appearing on this show to discuss your article. But with that said, I want to read this thing from Dan, uh, this, uh, one of these passages, uh, the, the best part. IP, intellectual property, can be copied even more easily than manufacturing plans and know-how can be relocated. And the value of brands is ephemeral. In the long run, the predictable outcome is not the technical IP and brand advantage the, of the U.S. that the U.S. will erode. And after that, the U.S. Will, will neither be a knowledge economy nor a manufacturing superpower. It will be as if 18th century Britain had traded its woolen industries for winemaking. We will be an economic relic. That's the part that I regard as sort of craziest and juiciest. And why do I say that? Because he is actually now telling us that he knows how to do industrial planning. He's got the vision. And what vision does he have? We will no longer be a manufacturing superpower. So if he wants us to prevent IP and brand advantage from occurring, if he wants our industrial planners to have his foresight that we can lose uh, the march on that because uh, IP and brands are easily stolen or subverted and that we won't become a man, we won't be a manufacturing superpower anymore. What's left? Well, Dan thinks that in order for us to avoid being an economic relic, we have to stick to manufacturing. But of course, then we'd ask Dan, in terms of your crystal ball and your ability to plan for us in terms of national economic planning, you know how difficult it is to compete in that way because clearly they've got a lot of cheap labor abroad to compete with us. And you know how easy it is for goods to be shipped across borders these days. And so where are we left, Dan, with your solution? But that's only sort of making fun of Dan as the would-be national economic planner. My real problem is his idea that we will be an economic relic. Now, to begin with, also empirically, as I argued against Steve Moore uh, the other night, and you can get to my uh, that part of it later, Tom, my argument with Steve Moore, my debate with him, I said, Steve, you have said over and over again that China is marching in the wrong direction. They are becoming more of a managed economy than they used to be. They're suppressing entrepreneurship. And you know, Steve, just as well as I, that such economy 
economies do not handle intellectual property very well. It's one thing to steal our intellectual property. It's another thing to be able to implement it. You need a Jeff Bezos to know how to implement intellectual property, know how to sell it. You need a Je- when Jeff Bezos marketed the Kindle, it wasn't as though the Kindle had not been developed before. The electronic readers exist. Jeff Bezos understood that in order to market it, you have to have a hundred thousand titles available on that Kindle from the get-go. And so Jeff Bezos twisted arms and threatened publishers because he needed 100,000 cheap titles on that Kindle right away. He was the one who was able to market it. Now look at China. If, if it's going to be a bunch of bureaucrats, they're not going to get anywhere. So therefore, I'm not even that, uh, that so to speak, quote unquote, afraid that China is going to steal our IP and brand advantage. And even, uh, even Steve Moore said the other night, it looks like like you need Silicon Valley for that. You know, so this fear that they're stealing our intellectual property is a little ridiculous. But then beyond that about our being an economic relic, that other part, which I addressed, that China is an existential threat to us economically, that we want to be the dominant economy in, in intellectual property. Well, you know, the Swedes, the Danes, the Canadians, the Finns, they seem to get along fine without their country being dominant in IP. And if China... If China suddenly goes free market more, if their market liberalization accelerates, and if, a, and if a galaxy of Chinese entrepreneurs invents things that we've never heard of, and the Chinese become the kings of intellectual property, what's to complain about it? Are they not? They, if he says that intellectual property is easily stolen, then, then we'll get it anyway. And of course, obviously, if they're market-oriented economy, they're going to want to sell it to us. So this nationalist fervor for the U.S., to, for Team USA is playing ball, is playing a, a life and death game against China, USA. That, that sort of nationalist top-down mentality is tragic. It's non-libertarian. It's hardly even conservative. And now getting back to what I think is Dan's fundamental problem, Dan is a conservative and he's unfortunately turning to government to conserve his values. And that's a Faustian bargain. We all know that. What Dan ought to do is more proactively try to get people and institutions to act conservatively according to his lights. To some degree, the market does act conservatively. Landmarks and monuments and wonderful buildings that always have market value and nonprofits invest in them and nonprofits conserve nature. So the conservative impulse in markets is already there and Dan can encourage it through the free market. So I guess I can shut up now, uh, Tom, and ask if you have anything to add. Well, what I have to add is that folks should check out Gene Epstein's Soho Forum. Yeah, okay. Because this, not only should you attend the events in person, yes. but if Thank you. by some misfortune you don't live within driving distance of the area, New York City, yeah. you can consume the debates through uh, audio or video at your leisure. And they are on such great and interesting topics, and the debates are generally quite civil, yeah. and there's a lot of light shed. <laughs> oh, generally so, quite civil. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I think so. The well, Soho always Forum. Quite civil, Tom. Okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Tom. Well, the website is thesohoforum.org, so right. uh, you want to yeah. check that out. Right, and we have uh, a, we have a dedicated podcast now that was installed by the recent people, recent founders, yes. uh, the Soho Forum debates, where you can get all our debates on podcast. The Soho Forum debates and uh, the, the the debate that I lost is supposed to be released today at least on podcast and uh, tomorrow and in a few days on video uh, and so I hope you listen to that debate that I lost thank you for the plug Tom and indeed the soul forum is looking forward to ultimately hosting Tom Woods at our soul forum and we will see I, I would like to do it <laughs> as you know we can't say uh, uh, right now but it does depend on right now absolutely and it depends on certain things but even if that one doesn't work out, Tom, I'm going to get you in the end. And Tom, I want you to know, is accepting the chump change of $2,000 that we offer. And and uh, and also... Oh, you shouldn't tell people what the fee is. <laughs> well, you, but Tom, 
um, look, we're transparent. We do that. <laughs> Not me. But, I, but I, I, know, I know Tom's mental accounting. Where do I have Tom? Where do I have Tom? Is that I'm based in Manhattan. So Tom quickly calculated 2,000 plus expenses. I can blow it all in a few Broadway shows. Yes, I, exactly. I, that, was ex- <laughs> that was precisely Tom, the way I thought of it. By the way, Tom, Tom thinks, well, an all expense paid uh, big, uh, trip to New York and all I have to do is debate at the Soul Forum. Fine. I can see yeah. the play, go, play that goes wrong a ninth exactly. time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whatever Gene wants me to do, I'll just go do it and then then have some fun. All right. Well, listen, uh, th- remember, everybody, at the Soho Forum, if you do attend in person, yeah. just go up to Gene and say the name Tom Woods. You get a free drink at the Absolutely. bar. I think everybody yes. knows that by yes. now. And you make an interesting point, Tom, that uh, you put that idea in my head because you're such a fair-minded guy. If Tom Woods is actually a debater up there, yeah, isn't it sort of like going to be rigging a game that it also gets you a free drink at the bar? I got to think that one through, Tom. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> interesting moral dilemma. All yeah. right. Thanks a lot, That's Gene. Best with that. Okay. Thanks again, Tom. All right, folks, that's our episode for today. Tomorrow we are talking about deplatforming, that whole phenomenon, and what you can do to protect yourself against it. We've got some specific suggestions for you with the author of a brand new book on the subject. So make sure and check that out. Subscribe over at tomwoods.com slash Apple, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.